Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Extra Time TV. We have a special episode today. The Euros have kicked off. And the Italians have started off this tournament in extremely positive fashion with a 3-0 victory over Turkey. It's an amazing game, but we have our usual guy, James Baird, our man from Scotland, and a special guest today, folks. Someone who's going to represent that lovely country. Sandro Grande, how are you today? I'm well. How about you guys? Not bad at all. You know, we know you're all smiles. We know that you can't contain yourself. <laughs> uh, James and I are very anxious to hear your opinion. So obviously, you know, it's a, a 3-0 uh, victory for Italy. It started off really well. And if um, what I'm hearing is true, this is the first time uh, Italy has uh, started the Euros with a 3-0 victory uh, with an own goal from uh, Demiral. Uh, uh, then in the 66 minute, Immobile and Lorenzo in the 79th minute. Uh, so let's get your first reactions to this. What are your thoughts on the game? Look, I think uh, they, uh, they were composed. Uh, for the first time in my lifetime, I'm 43. Um, mm -hmm. I've not, I haven't gone into a tournament uh, feeling relaxed. Uh, <laughs> and the reason being is that we've always gone into tournaments and the first way of playing is always defensive and playing on the counter and not, not conceding. And I knew going into this tournament because I've been following them for the past uh, my lifetime, but now in the past two years, two and a half years since uh, Mancini's been there, uh, there's a different aura behind, behind this, this squad. Uh, their first thought is to play football. And I always said that if they were able to learn how to play football a little bit like Spain, because you're never going to play like Spain, because Spain is just another level with regards to possession. But if you can learn how to play like them and ha still have the DNA of the Italian defending, uh, the sky's the limit. And today, instead of losing the ball in the attacking third or attacking half and retreating 60 yards back towards their own goal. They were pressing the whole time and they wanted to keep pressing and they wanted to win ball, the, the, the ball back quickly. So I think their defensive transition um, that they used to use in the past was, was backing up. They've changed it into going forward and winning the ball back is, uh, was fantastic today. They didn't let uh, Turkey breathe. Uh, Turkey had a hard time stringing a few passes in a row. And look, um, I think it's going to be a positive uh, few weeks for them. And I hope they can uh, stay healthy and uh, just, again, get to the Final Four. And then when you get to the Final Four, anything can happen. Yes, yes. You know, a lot of people, were, uh, when uh, Mancini was appointed, you know, their eyebrows were raised. I mean, uh, I'm a fan of him since all the way back when he was a player. And then when he coached Lazio yeah. and then at Inter. And, you know, uh, obviously he went over to Manchester City and, you know, he, well, at least in my circles, at least he's not, uh, he was not the favorite choice, but after not qualifying the last time around and, uh, you know, they really had a great set of form coming into this. Uh, you know, if uh, my stats are correct and you can let me know, uh, you know, 28 games without defeat. Um, you know, this is the first time they scored three goals in the Euros in an opening game, uh, you know, so. This is pretty impressive because you know you know about the stereotypes that people have in Italy. They're going to defend. They're going to score one goal, as you just said. And this game was, you know, completely the opposite. They're playing football. Uh, for those who follow Mancini, this is the style of football he likes to play. Uh, you know, a lot of people were concerned about the goal scoring heading into the tournament. In, in addition to the stereotypes, so what do you think about them? You know, scoring three today. Look, I mean, the goal scoring is is a question mark. I mean, you know, there's there there aren't many countries that are gonna get are gonna bring on a pitch a, a Ronaldo or a, a Harry Kane or a uh, you know a Romelu Lukaku or you know th these guys are are they don't come every day. But now, if you're a Spain, if we look at Spain today and we say, okay, who's their striker? Off the top of my head, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, there are some good players, but the reality is 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 it's, it's a team game, and uh, Italy Italy is showing that. I mean, they have multiple guys scoring goals. Um, and I think that's key. I, I mean, guys on the bench like uh, Chiesa, who had a fantastic season this year, uh, is going to be able to uh, to contribute. Uh, Verratti still a little bit uh, injured, so he's going to come in soon. Uh, and look, this this is a game that um, it's not like any other game. It's not like the NBA where you just give the ball to one guy and everybody stands back and plays one v one the whole field. It doesn't work like that. And uh, Italy's team game right now is 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 uh, is exceptional and. Uh, you know, 24 attempts on goal is, is something that uh, that's uh, to be applauded. I mean, uh, last year, Liverpool, every game had between, probably not every game, but most of the games they had between 25 and 30 shots towards goal. How fantastic were they to watch, you know, and they were playing attacking football. And Italy today was, was really good. I'm not comparing them to Liverpool of last year, but um, I, I enjoyed it and I, I look forward to the next games. 
Yes, yes. So, you know, uh, although the excitement for Italy is clearly there, you know, uh, James, you know, just a quick reaction. You know, let's talk about Turkey real quick. Uh, speaking of opposition, you know, Italy obviously had a, you know, usually you don't see this, you know, but, you know, it's 61% according to ESPN and 39% for Turkey. It seemed as if they tried to play for the counterattack. And they did have, you know, a couple attempts, you know, uh, which were few and far between because Italy uh, well and truly controlled this game. Uh, what are your thoughts on tu- Turkey's approach for this game? Because they were doing pretty well heading into this tournament as well. Well, I think that's true because they came into the tournament only conceding three goals in qualification. They looked hot. I mean, I mean, I was watching the intros before the game and saying, well, you know what? Turkey may give Italy a game, but they just did not show up today. I mean, I think um, they relied too heavily on their skipper, Yilmaz, um, and he was up there on his own. Like a, He was so isolated. Um Ironically, they had five in midfield, but they could not cope with the midfield three of Italy. I mean, I think the movement, the passing, the way that um, that midfield three for Italy, Locatelli, Giorginio and Barella played was just phenomenal. But, I mean, in the first half, I think the one key for Turkey was their goalkeeper, Shakir, who had um, he had an excellent save, if I remember, um, with his right hand tipping over the bar. But he then went to become villain because I think if you look at the two goals that Italy got in the second half, um, at least one of them I can remember, he makes a bad pass and then obviously he's punished because it was a wonderful goal from Insigne. So um, he went from hero to villain, you know, and right in a matter of 45 minutes. But there was not enough players stood out for me. I mean, um, I think the coach made some strange changes, especially in the second half, which I found that um, when he took off um, a midfielder, put on an extra defender at times. But there just was not enough from them. They looked like a, a wounded dog in the second half. And... Um, Although people are saying, mate, yes, I mean, they're, in, they're still in a good position, they can qualify. Um, from what I saw today, I can't see it because Switzerland are a very good team, as we know. Wales, obviously, um, will be looking to make do some damage. So it's, they're looking up against the ropes. So I was a little disappointed in them, especially after promising so much before the tournament. Yep, you read my mind with the next question because I was going to ask you about uh, the upcoming matches because, you know, there's Switzerland and Wales in this group, uh, you know, this is a pretty decent team. And heading into this game, you know, I was concerned. A lot of people were asking me, you know, obviously we know it's 3-0 now. And I know Sandro is happy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it was looking like it was going to be a tight game. And, and there were a lot of nerves up until that goal was scored. You know, I saw all the forums, you know, all my friends, you know, uh, who follow Syria were going nuts until eventually we got that own goal. And then when the second goal was scored, uh, you know, it seems as if, you know, Turkey never really had an answer at all. And uh, they're going to have to try to sort this out because... Uh, you know, the group stages, even though there's a third place playoff, you know, there's a lot of things you have to consider with goal difference and things like that. So, you know, Turkey's going to have to get it together in that next game and get together, get it together quickly, which is going to be difficult because neither one of the other teams are going to be easy. Uh, you know, so heading back to uh, Italy now. So, you know, usually in any big competition, Italy is always one of the names mentioned, World Cup, Euros, whatever. But, uh, you know, Sandro, heading into the Euros before today's game, you know, do you think that this performance, uh, you know, shocked maybe not Italians, but, you know, everyone else as well? Look, if it shocked anybody, I mean, it's, it's uh, you, you know, the people that haven't been watching them regularly. I mean, who, who has been watching them really has, has seen a, a brand of football that's, that's, that's enjoyable. I mean, they played, they played Holland uh, not too long ago in the past year and, and they had an excellent game against Holland as well. So, um, you know, what's, what's, uh, what's helped them in this uh, shaping of what they look like today is that, yeah, they did have some, they did have some easier games in, in, in some of the qualifying and some of the world cup qualifying in the nation's league. They did have a few easier games that, that helped them really get the groove and get, get rolling, you know, and um, look, they have no phenoms. They have no phenoms, but I said it today on another, um, on another forum. I said, the reality is, is that when you have, like everybody's talking about France and I'm talking about France as well. I'm not, I'm not going to say they're not going to be one of the favorites. They are, but historically those big um, marquee uh, uh, nations that are going to come into the tournament as favorites, they hardly ever win in, in 1982, Brazil, same thing, Italy in 1990, same thing in 86. Nobody was hope no, nobody was betting on Argentina, even though they did have uh, um, uh, Maradona. Maradona yeah. So, you know, like, uh, Tournaments historically don't go to the ones that are favorites, you know, and and um, and it's going to be tough for for France to do something. I don't know how many countries have done it, but how many countries have, have played in three finals in a row? 
yeah Euro, you know and, uh, World, World Cup and Euro again I, I'm not sure there, there, there are many um, so it's, it's going to be tough for them but look I'm enjoying my uh, my uh, my team and um, I can't wait to, to, to see the next games yes yes and you made a very valid point because uh, you know even as recently as World Cup 2018 you know Germany looked like uh, everybody thought they were going to just blow everybody away and we saw what happened so you know you're right there's a Precedence historical data that backs this up that, you know, usually the favorites on paper. And I'm going to use the overused cliche, <laughs> the game's not played on paper, folks. So, you yeah. know, that's that's how it goes, you know. Even Spain, when they won, nobody was paying attention before they went on their run. Yeah. And then even when they won those Euros and they played in the next World Cup, people were already writing them off. And then when they were actually favorites, they fell apart <laughs> in uh, Brazil. So, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things, you know. Um, Italy... You know, it's the reason why I'm going to focus a lot on Italy today. It's, uh, you know, Mancini, uh, you know, that they are the stereotypes of Italy playing defensive football, which obviously the defensive DNA is part of the culture. It's very much appreciated, you know, seeing Keelan do that fist pump, you know, late in the game, you know, keeping a clean sheet. That's how important it is for them. And uh, you made a valuable point before we got started that, uh, you know, now they have the ability to score goals based on this game and also balance defense and offense. And, you know, Mancini went into this game with, uh, you know, the 4-3-3 formation. Do you think that, you know, a lot of people have criticized Mancini in his, as a club coach uh, where, you know, he's the kind of guy could get you a league, but he often gets it wrong in the UEFA Champions League and those knockout competitions. Uh, do you think without uh, assuming that they, you know, without being presumptuous, they get to the, uh, the group stages that, you know, he has what it takes to get Italy to the final and go all the way? Yeah, I think I think there's a few things that you know it's not just playing well. Uh, there, there's 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 many things that go into it. The, the dressing room, the harmony. Um, in 2006, when Italy won the World Cup, there was a massive story just before the World Cup, and it was everything against Italy and about the, the betting scandal and about Juventus being rele relegated and and all this stuff surrounding the, the the club. Well, if we look back in the past year, the first country to be hit from COVID uh, massively was Italy, and and. It seems like when when these types of things happen to this this culture, this this nation, they they kind of all get together and they they all go towards, um, to you know they all tread in the same direction. So, for me, you know, like um, when they did have those phenoms, and I'm Italian, I love Totti and I love Del Piero and I love Roberto Baggio and all the phenoms that they've had. But the Italian media has never helped those guys become become what they truly were, which were world-class. And now they don't have those guys. So now the media has nobody to focus on really, you know? So they're a little bit more relaxed in their shoes. You know, when Baggio was around, yeah, he's going to take us all the way alone. And if he didn't do it, he's a big failure. No, he's not a big failure. He's just a great player that maybe didn't have the luck to win, you know? But, um, you know, and, and Del Piero and Totti, there was always a scandal. Who's going to play? Who's not going to play? They can't be on the pitch at the same time. And, and so all these little things, now the media has nowhere to look like it's okay. So who, who are we going to pick at? These are all young kids that work really hard. And you know what? They played with a 4-3-3, but attacking wise, it was not a 4-3-3 at all because Spinazzola was up the pitch and you really only had Chiellini and, and Bonucci at the back. Florenzi was up the pitch in the first half, a little bit less than Spinazzola. And in the second half, Di Lorenzo, same thing, a little bit less than Spinazzola, but he was getting up the pitch. So they were kind of only two at the back when they were attacking. And Jorginho always there in front, uh, pulling strings. I mean, he was, he, was, uh, he was running an orchestra in, in the middle there. He was fantastic, you know. So, look, I, I think it's, uh, it's good. I, I think it's, uh, the second round is going to be, um, you know, hopefully we get there because this is just one game. But um, I think it's, it's, it's all positive. Yes, yes. You know, I, you know, James and I were talking about this off air before we got on about, uh, you know, our favorites and, you know, our teams. And I know uh, we spoke about our preference for defenders. James, you know, basically was saying, you know, he put Benucci. So, James, you know, I'm just going to throw this at you since we had you really quiet for a couple of seconds. Uh, you, you saw today, you know, the, the performance of Benucci and Kulini today. Uh, so would you uh, what do you think about the, the center back pairing? Would you change well, your mind now? I want them both. <laughs> they were so good. I mean, I think they have that. They have a great parent together. I mean, one goes, one stays. I mean, and even as Sandro said, I like how Italy pushed on and they just left those two back in a sense for long periods and it allowed to, uh, Italy to, to press so high. I mean, they have a high line anyway, you know, and um, it allowed them to get more bodies forward. And they were able, the way Italy were able to possess the ball 
at such a high pace for periods of the game was phenomenal. And I think that's all credit to, to Mancini because um, I think, as you, as you rightly said, club football is different to international football. And he seems to have changed, you know, his, I mean, they were talking in the studio before about um, he's changed a lot as a person. You know, before when he was a player, he thought he was a superstar and now he's matured a little bit. And I think you've seen that maturity in the way he's coaching as well. Because as, as Sandro said, there's, no necess- there's not necessarily a superstar there, but he has them all playing with such togetherness. I mean, you saw it when um, Cellini obviously cleared the ball and the fist pump. I mean, obviously they don't have Buffon anymore but they have a young goalkeeper who is phenomenal, you know, behind them, 22 years old, who will be there for many, many, many moons, sorry. So, and then um, Sandra touched on Jorginho, and this is somebody that a lot of people don't like, you know. I, I mean, I've had conversations in Trinidad especially. They don't value this guy, which is absolutely ludicrous because, I mean, the work rate this guy, I mean, I don't want to, you know, label him, but he reminds me of Perlo. The work rate, the way he's, as Sandra said, able to organise the orchestra. He, I mean, he is key, he's integral to this team. And I think he is very underrated. And you can't forget, he just won a Champions League medal. So all these things together. And as I say, Svenazola was, I mean, to me on that left, was one of the key players. The way he got forward and he was able to whip balls in, you know, the little um, combination passing he had with um, Locatelli, you know, it was brilliant. So I thought it was a great polished performance, but... As we said, it's one game and there's a lot, I and mean, there's two more at least to go, and obviously, hopefully, a lot more for it. Yep. And uh, you, once again, James, James, you're, you're a mind reader all of a sudden. <laughs> I, I, we're going to have to ask if James has some sort of mind reading abilities because you're taking all my questions away with your, 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 your answers. Because Jorginho, he's a guy, as you rightfully said, you know, when Sari brought him to Chelsea, uh, you know, he was a guy that I liked, and I'm sure all of you agree. We, you know, I, I look at Syria a lot, obviously, you know, Sandro as well. Uh, but yet often he's oftentimes made a scapegoat for a lot of problems, which is a whole other discussion. You know, I don't want to get sidetracked with that, but I'm really glad that, you know, now that the world audience is seeing, cause he was, he was great today, but collectively is what I was impressed with that, that they were able to consistently sustain that pressure because James and I were wondering if they could, and if they would fizzle out after a while, because Turkey, as good as they are, I think they were shell shocked by Italy's, uh, relentless pace. I think they, they were like stunned and they tried to do the counter-attack, which I, I, I can understand. I appreciate a good counter-attack and I'm pretty sure Italians do as well, <laughs> you know, sit back and, you know, counter, but uh, they, they didn't get it. And even the, the, the chances that they get was sort of like from a, they got was from like a deflection uh, from a free kick that, you know, was a bit scary, but you know, they recovered. There was one, you know, marginally scary case where, you know, uh, I think they took a free kick, uh, it bounced off, and uh, you know they chased after it. Eventually, they get, came down, and then uh, you know the the save, by the way, was all classy. You know he got the ball, and he dropped it in front of the line uh, for the ref to see that hey, I'm not going to keep this out. So you know, as a as a apparent neutral, which I'm supposed to be, I was excited by the game. I love that for the Euros. This was the first opening game, and you know. People didn't say it was a snore fest. It was a very exciting game for the neutrals. I know a lot of people were messaging me who are not fans of Italy. They're EPL fans, so naturally, the three lions, it's coming home and all that. <laughs> we'll see. It's never going to happen see. as far as I'm concerned. We, we'll see about that one. <laughs> we'll see about that one. We never know. You know. That's a whole other story. And maybe we'll have Sandro chat with us about that. But for now, the topic is Italy. Congratulations to you know Italy having a great game today. But... Uh, this is going to be difficult because we've pretty much spoke about the, the team effort about Italy. And I'll ask both of you guys this. I'll start with you, James, and then we'll head across to Sandro. Who do you think was the key player today for Italy? Well, you know what? I'm going to give it to, as I say, we mentioned Jorginho. I think he was, he was phenomenal. He, he organized as well as, obviously, the passing he made. And if he was not there, I do not think they would have had an, as, as an easier time going forward. He allowed the players in front of him to, obviously... To work, you know, and I think he was key for them. And I mean, even to bring a little fact in, when you see where this guy came from, 16 year old, I think that I read that he came from a monastery, he got left there, you know, yeah. he fought through so much adversity. And look at this guy now. I mean, brilliant. Yes, yes, you know, amazing story. You know, Sandro, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, Jorginho was um, the, the, the thing there is that when you have a player like that, and the same thing in the Champions League final with, uh, with Chelsea. Uh, it allows it allowed Kante and Mason Mount and Havertz to go, 
and just go because you know he was going to stay and he was going to help out all the time and the same thing today look at telly went at times a little bit less than barella but still went insigne went berardi went florenzi went and he was always there making sure that you know what chiellini and um and bonucci are always going to have a safety net in front of them always going to have a guy that's reading the game very intelligent so all these north North American people that say you need to be an athlete to play soccer. I guarantee you that if Jorginho was in North America, he'd probably not be an athlete because he has nothing of a build of an athlete. But yet in this game, in this game, in the game of football, he's got this. And this <laughs> is much more important than what your legs can do and what your body can do. And he, he just reads the game, intercepts balls, keeps it. He's always an option in possession. He hardly ever loses the ball. He's not going to be dribbling. And if he does dribble, it's just to get out of a little bit of a pressure, but it's not, you know, not these huge skills or whatever, you know, it's elegant. So I think he's key in, in this, in this, uh, in this team, in this group, when Verratti comes back, it's going to be the same thing. Cause he's another really tricky player and, and can keep the team in possession played with a, you know, played with uh, is playing with one of the biggest clubs in the world and, and uh, you know, plays that style of play. So when you have this type of player who's disciplined, who reads the game well, and who just pulls strings, you know, the, okay, we got too many balls on the right. Let, let's, let's reverse the ball. You know, he's basically orchestrating what the team is going to be doing. And it's unfortunate, James, but like you say, like they don't get enough praise. These players here don't get enough praise. Like I'm hoping that's, that somebody sees, like, I don't know who's going to win the Euro cup and the Ballon d'Or is going to be in December. But if, if, if N'Golo Conte is not in the final one, <laughs> two three players for the ballon d'or it's a shame yep. because you can't always give it to ronaldo and messi and and uh, and lewandowski be just because they score goals there's some players like this that if they don't play the team doesn't win and it, they're not going to win by 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 scoring goals but, but that's ha- that's happened for years because it seems to always be the striker i mean i think if i'm not mistaken i think Manuel Neuer maybe won at one. I can't remember. There was, an, there was one time that he was there or thereabouts. But even for a goalkeeper to be considered as, phenom- as phenomenal. But you're right. It should not just go to a striker. It, it should go to the best player. And that could yeah. be anybody. There's 11 guys in the field each time. So that's a great point. Look, uh, in 2006, Cannavaro won. Yep. You could have also given it to, uh, to Pirlo. Like in the 2006 World Cup, he was unbelievable, right? Um, Messi, Ronaldo out of the last 12 years, should have won it 10 years. I don't know. You know, like they're so, they've been so fantastic and their, their numbers are just crazy. Like, like it's out of this world. I mean, you know, James, uh, how, how you're able to score 30 goals every year is, is unbelievable, you know? So for sure, they're always going to be in the mix. Their names are always going to be in the mix. But it's, it's time that we start to give importance to guys like, like Kante, to guys like Pogba, you know, to guys like Modric, you know, like Modric won uh, recently, you know, but we, we need to promote these types of, because sometimes without these types of players, teams don't win. It's just harder to realize how, how much more difficult the team would play if, if they wouldn't be playing, you know? So. Yep. Yeah. You guess, made a very interesting it's all, point. It's all because I'm a number six. I used to play in front of these things. I'm saying this, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it, I, I feel like they, they don't get recognized as much, you know? Yeah. You know, like you made a very interesting point, which I really like because I personally, Tell a lot of people what you're saying. You know, I'm a huge fan of players like Cambiasso and Mascherano and, you know, Veron and those types of players, Redondo. So you're speaking my language because one of the problems, uh, you know, and James can tell you this, is that I have a huge problem with uh, the emphasis on an athlete versus a footballer. And I think even Roberto Baggio said, I can't remember what he said, uh, but he did say, and this is not his exact quote, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was before 2010. So it was some time ago where, you know, football is now filled with athletes and not footballers anymore. And lots of people didn't understand what he meant by that. You know, a lot of people where, where I am were like, what's he talking about? But I was like, I've seen it where, you know, the, the tactical intelligence and the brain, uh, you know, is, is, is something that's vastly overlooked. I don't know if it's marketing or whatever, but these players are getting undervalued. And I actually thought in 2006 when Cannavaro uh, got, you know, the award that I was like, hmm, maybe... Things are changing and then they went straight back, you know, but you can't argue Messi and Ronaldo. I mean, as you said, these guys are insane, but I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I think it hurts a lot of developmental uh, places, especially in this side of the world with the U.S., even in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean is an emphasis on physical uh, athletic players. And oftentimes, you know, they get shown up when they meet more, 
you know, tactically intelligent guys who just, they run less and they do a lot more. So listen, guys, we'll end things off, but we'll definitely, this has sparked some discussions that I'll definitely like to have in future about, you know, football development, you know, the nations, you know, and the other team's chances. So, you know, Sandro, let's, let's uh, end things off by asking. So Italy obviously had an amazing start. We've seen teams and Italy as well, you know, uh, when start off really well and then it just went completely crazy. Um, you know, how do you think Roberto Mancini is going to try to deal with uh, possible complacency if there's any? How do you think uh, you, you, they're going to approach this? Or is this team nice and young and hungry and united? What are your thoughts on this? Look, I think he's going to rotate a couple of players in mm-hmm. for next game. Um, and then he's going to rotate for the third game. And then... You know, after that, look, it's it's 28 games that there's there's a nice feeling in the dressing room. There's no scandals on the newspaper about the, the national team. There's always been. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed who's who's in his staff, but you talked about Mancini yeah. in, back in the days when he used to play with Sampdoria. Well, in his staff, there's Viali. Yep. There's Lombardo. You know, these are three guys that played for Sampdoria back in the days when Sampdoria was, wow, uh, one of the teams that everybody looked forward to watching. Uh, I, I used to look forward to watching them on Sunday mornings um when they only used to play on sunday mornings you know yes uh, but the good old you know, days he's built a, a very cool staff and staff of guys that have played the game at a certain level and and um they're going to be able to relate to the players Gianluca Vialli is going to be able to sit down with the players Daniele De Rossi that just joined the staff is going to be able to sit down with the players Lombardo cool head Mancini like you said when he played he was a little bit of a firecracker. Now he's, he seems very calm. He seems very composed, you know? So look, uh, hopefully uh, things stay on track and, um, and uh, they, they, they get as far as they can, you know? And, and that's, that's all that counts. I also saw uh, O'Reilly, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Did I see him? I thought I saw wrong the Inter Milan. Uh... Eranio, Eranio. Okay, Eranio, yeah, right, right. So, yeah. I like. I thought I was seen wrong. I was like, "Is that him?" You know. Uh, so that's that's pretty good. I guess the Inter Milan connection when he was there, uh, you know, he was a nice presence on the bench for yeah. Inter Milan this season. And now, it, you know, well, that's a whole other story. I won't get into that. So, guys, uh, for those of you who are tuning in, uh, be sure to like, subscribe, comment in the comment section below. We'll be trying to chat with everybody from uh, different countries during the Euros and also the Copa America. So, you know, that as well. We have lots of football, folks. Lots of football. And you know, we'll end things off with uh, you know. Listen, Sandro, it's been a pleasure to have you. Um, you know, your, your insight is very valuable because we'd love to hear not, you know, uh, an outsider's opinion, but somebody who's been there, who's played football in Italy. And uh, folks, if in case you're wondering why we have this gentleman here, it's because he's played the game in Italy, folks. You know, uh, in Frosinone and, you know, Brescia as well. And, um, you know, we'll definitely, would lo- we would love to have you in future episodes. So, you know, thanks for being here, Sandro. Thank you guys very much for having me. I mean... Uh... When we need to talk soccer, not a problem. All right, and you know, I'll, I'll be I'll be available. All right, and well, of course, we have James that you all know. So James, you know, you're stuck with us. James is not going anywhere. <laughs> so you know, James has this is a special tournament for James. Scotland is there, so you know, it's it's going to be exciting. So be sure to like, subscribe, comment in the comment comment section below. Follow us, and we have lots of football to talk about. Thank you for joining us. Just to remind everyone, for more episodes with Shaka Hislop, be sure to head over to our YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe for more updates, interviews and content.